Welcome to Your Brand Amplified, the podcast where we interview marketers, publicists, and brands to learn their stories, what makes them tick, and tips and tricks that make a difference. From sunny Redondo Beach, California, to I hopefully sunny San Diego, California, I am Annika Jackson with Your Brand Amplified. Really excited to have Andrea Jensen, the cash flow CFO, on the show today. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Of course. Now, I would love for you to talk about your background. You were an accounting major. Did you go straight into entrepreneurship? Did you work at other organizations first? What was that journey like? And so many questions about cash flow and everything else that we're going to get into once we hear this. And uh, yeah, I call myself an accidental accounting person. Uh, it, funny story, I was in college and uh, playing soccer. And I thought, oh, gosh, I don't even know what I want to do as my major. So I just started down the business track because there was so many ways you could go. And I started taking all my prereq classes and I took accounting, aced it, took accounting too, aced it, took class again, aced it. My professor pulled me aside one day and he said, you know, this doesn't come naturally to most people. And I was like, really? Because I hardly even study in these classes. Like, it just was literally like my brain was wired that way. And I I just, it was what it was. And so that is how I, I became an accidental accountant. I just kept taking more classes and I really, really, I liked it. I didn't understand how much of an asset that was going to be later in life for me. It was really just one of those things that like, I love business, business models and money. And I love the study of all of those things and how you could just tweak one or two things here or there. And it makes, you know, such a big difference. So that's how I got started uh, in the accounting industry. And I did end up going into corporate right out of college. I worked for a venture capital firm. I worked for a private equity company. I opened the W in San Diego, uh, so Starwood. I left working for them and ended up becoming a consultant down the road. And so all kinds of fun stuff. So my early, you know, career was big corporations, big accounting departments, big dollars and things on the balance sheet and the P&L. And I kind of had my daughter and uh, she was very young and diagnosed with cancer. And so um, she's almost 15 now and she's great. Everything is good. So it has a, a very happy ending. But I completely took a turn in the corporate climb that I was, you know, on and decided like, no, I need to slow it down a little bit. So I went to work for a publicly traded oil and gas company and going from such a fast paced environment, the the previous positions that I held to then this one that was very sleepy and very a slow moving machine. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to lose it here. So <laughs> that's really when I was like, okay, Goldilocks here, let's try starting my own business. And that's really where, you know, my passion lies. And I've been able to pull on so much of the experience that I had working for the other organizations and bring it to the small to medium sized businesses and really, you know, make big, big, big impact there. Fantastic. And you have a couple parts to your business. You act as a fractional CFO, an accounting partner, but you also have a program that you created called the Predictable Profit Accelerator. Yeah. Yeah. And to be honest, I have a team of fractional CFOs and accountants and they get to work with our amazing clients, you know, day to day. And it really frees me up to expand, you know, our offerings. How are we supporting them? Like what's next that our clients need? And so I'm in creating those delivery assets, if you will. And the predictable profit method, as any business owner knows, when you go to scale, you've got to have a process, a repetition, a thing that's like I call it the recipe to bake the cake. I know that if you give me your business and I do this in this order, and you're going to get a very profitable business model. And so that is our predictable profit um, method there. And all of our CFOs use that with our clients so that we know that everybody's getting repeatable process. The results are, uh, depends on whether I'm delivering it, someone on my team is delivering it, it's all gonna be a win and the client's gonna be really happy at the end. That's fantastic. And at at what point when somebody's starting a business, should they 
use a tool like that? Like, can you start when you're first starting and you're trying to figure out financial modeling and all of that fun stuff and profitability? Yeah, absolutely. I think like the 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 highlights here are that we're helping you with your pricing, right? Because if you set your pricing correctly, that's going to give you all the right margins that you need in the business. So I like to say, if you think of every dollar in revenue that your business generates, that dollar equals 100%. And you have to choose how you're going to allocate that 100% into the different buckets in your business. And so to make it super simple, we say there's four buckets. So you've got your cost of goods sold or cost of revenue if you're a service-based business, but to keep it very simple, we'll just call it cost of goods sold, your general and administrative expenses, your marketing, and your profit. So if you just take that 100% and you've got to allocate it between those four big buckets, that's going to look a little different for every business model, every industry, but that's cracking the code. So if you can get it to where you're delivering your product or your service, you know, you're covering your overhead, your general and administrative, your indirect labor, your marketing is bringing in the right amount of customers at the right prices, all of those things, when you can get it and your profit is at 20% or more, if you can crack that code, you're going to go on to be uh, have a very successful business. Nice. I feel like that is where so many of us make our first mistakes is on the financial side. We might have ideas. I When I started my PR firm during the pandemic, then has morphed into other businesses. I was like, I need to reprove myself in PR because I just moved back to LA. I hadn't done PR in this city for a while. So I was charging really low prices. And then I found, oh, but if I add more team members, it's not going like the retainers are not going to cover all of those costs, but I'm not a finance person. And so thinking about like, how do you then make sure that you're making the right amount? Like you said, how do you make sure you're not paying too many people or you're not upscaling your employees or your team side too fast? So all of these things are things that could be solved if you have good financial modeling. (laughs) Absolutely. So just so that all of your listeners know, that's exactly what a fractional CFO does. We're creating a a staff utilization schedule. We're looking at your cost to deliver whatever it is you're selling. And you've got to be able to break it down into, you know, a recipe. I keep going back to that, but it's really so true. You know, if you're offering service A, you need to know, okay, that requires an hour of an intake admin and they get paid this and this is their blended rate. And then it takes two hours of this team member to do this, this, this. And then it takes seven hours of this, this, this. Like you're breaking down the delivery of what it is that you're selling. So you really understand. So two things are going to come out of that. Number one, you're going to have a budget. So you're going to say, okay, team, if we're selling this service, this is what you're allocated and it should take you. And then they kind of have those bumper rails too, right? Because that's really important that they know what it looks like, you know, how much time they're allocated to each function. And then it's also helping you to understand, am I charging the right amount? So whatever it costs you to deliver that service, that should only be about 40, 50% of the sales price. And so if you just look, it's just a mathematical equation. So if you look at it and just go, okay, this is, you know, I think the hard part is sitting down and actually going, how much time does it actually take each person to do each, you know, what function does it, you know, have to go in and really map that out? That's really the hardest part. The rest is, you know, we know how much you're paying them per hour. We know benefits you're giving them and the employer taxes and all of those things. So we can layer all those in. So you have a true cost. Then you actually know where you should be setting your prices at. And this is where I'll also say something like this would be helpful if you have people in different states, because there are different tax rates in each state, depending on if they're contractors or employees, you might have to have a license in that state and like other sort of, you know, other things that you have to do that if you don't have the right person on your team in finance, giving you that advice and helping keep track of all of it, you might find yourself down the road owing money that you didn't realize that you owed or that you have a surplus somewhere, right? There's so many situations that can come up. So just having the right team in place, I can't emphasize this enough. If I were going back, that would probably be the first person I would have hired instead of the sixth or seventh or eighth. And I would have made sure it was somebody who really understood the financial modeling and would give me that kind of like the good advice. Like, do you really want to do that? Maybe you need to stop and think about this because if you do this, this is the road you might go down. Uh, And that modeling, I think it's so important. And it's something I think as entrepreneurs, a lot of times we get 
ideas because we want to solve something for ourselves, our family members, our loved ones, our friends. But we don't think about all of those other implications of what is it to start a business and what do you need to have financially set aside to just for the business operations that you mentioned is one of those factors. Absolutely. I can't stress this enough. And this is going to be something that I just, I we were talking about it internally just the other day. And I said, you know what? That's it. I'm taking a stand for profitability. Because as business owners, we exactly what you just said. We want to help. We're solving problems. But you're also given this beautiful opportunity to create an asset, which is your business, an asset that is going to provide wealth for you, for your family. And when I say wealth, like that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But at the end of the day, that means, am I putting money aside for my kids to go to college? Am I living in a house that fills my heart and my soul? Am I, you know, able to pay for my aging parents or whatever it is in your life? Like, this is the asset, just like every other, you know, you go buy a computer and they're like, oh, it's a fixed asset. Yes, it provides value for you, right? Same concept for your business. And I just don't think that enough business owners look at it that way. So it's like, you can serve your community and you can do good in the world by solving problems, but you also have to be responsible to yourself and to your family. And, you know, so I love that you're saying that because it's so important and more more business owners need to realize it and take a stand for 20% profit. You can't be um, under 20% and growing your business because you don't have the the margins to reinvest into the growth, to hire forward, to run that new marketing campaign, to, you know, test new products so you could do things better. And you're paying taxes out of that. You're servicing any debt the business has and you're taking a distribution, right? So you've got to have that 20%. It doesn't, when you really put a pen to paper, it's not that much money, right? 20%, it's not that much to do all of those very important functions in your business. So yeah, I could talk about that all day. <laughs> yeah, bring it on, bring it on. So at, at what point do people usually look to hire a CFO? And do you have recommendations around when they really should be looking to hire that? Uh, I know not everybody can afford a CFO, obviously, or the, a high priced accountant, but there are a lot of options out there where you can get the right help. Yeah. So number one hire should be a bookkeeper who is actually, you know, check their references, see some of their sample work, talk about deadlines and meeting deadlines and things like that. But you can hire a bookkeeper for five hours a week or five hours a month, whatever you need. But that right there is going to set you up for success right out the gate because you're going to get your book set up correctly, your chart of accounts set up correctly. You're going to get timely financial statements that are going to show you all of this effort that I'm doing, what is the result, right? Because your financial statements are just a scorecard. They don't mean you're a nice person or you're a bad person. It just means here's the result, the actions that you're taking in your business. So you want to make sure that that's set up out the gate because then come time for taxes and all that other non-sexy business stuff that we have to do as business owners, you just push a button, right? Instead of having to start that process. And it's so stressful if you wait, but doing it all along as you start and, you know, having that maintained, it's going to make your life so much better. So that's the first thing. Always, always, always get a good bookkeeper. And on my website, we actually have a guide on how to interview and, and hire a good bookkeeper because there's good ones out there. I know people have to kiss a few frogs before they get there, but the second thing is that's the beauty of the service that we provide. It's a fractional CFO offering. So you don't have to spend two hundred, three hundred thousand a year to hire a CFO because that just doesn't make sense for a lot of small to medium sized businesses. But you can work with a fractional CFO. I recommend if you're typically like past the five hundred thousand it's an investment. When you get to the million, it's an absolute critical mess because it just really depends. Like we have some clients that come to us before they're, you know, have even gotten any revenue. And they're like, I know what I'm setting this company up to do and I want to do it right out the gate. So I want you to run all this analysis for me. And we're creating all of the projections. We're creating all of the KPIs. We're creating all the things that they've just got this owner's manual now on exactly how to run the business. So it really just depends on how you want to look at it, whether it's an investment, you know, some like in the earlier stages, it's more of an investment for sure. But once you pass that million dollar mark, you've got a viable business 
right? You're, you probably have a team of five-ish. You are, you know, that's when things start to get too big for you to keep your arms wrapped around them. And that's where, you know, I have the conversation of like, you built it, now you need to protect it. And a lot of business owners don't look at it that way. And so what you're doing is that's really where they start to, you know, take bad loans. I call them the predatory loans, the ones that are like, I'm going to charge you 40% interest, but you don't know it because I buried it in the contract and I'm going to take it every week. I'm going to take my my money back. You get into a couple of those bad situations, it's hard to get out of those. It's hard to claw yourself back out because all your profits are going to pay for those things. So anyhow, get a CFO before you need financing, before you need all these things so that you can make the smart decisions and you've got somebody that can say, hey, go talk to this lender. It's the right type of lender for what you're looking for or your business model or this. You know, your CFO is is the top financial person in your business. So they should be the one that's helping you secure financing, creating that cash flow forecast so you know when you need financing. And also you always wanna get a line of credit or a business loan before you need it, right? You want to get it when everything looks good, not when you're running out of cash and you're desperate. That's when you end up taking the bad loans. So yeah, so those are kind of just some general areas of who you need and when and and how they really help your business. And will you please talk about, some people might think, oh, but even that's going to be too expensive for me. Can you talk to that? Do you have like standard rates for depending on what size their business is or where they are in the process, or is it, you know, one rate and you get X, Y, Z? Yeah. So for our model, we, it's that you buy a block of hours and you get a CFO assigned to you. So they know your business inside out. They know you, the business owner, because we're all very, very different. We make decisions differently. We take risk differently. We, you know, just, there's so many different nuances to how each individual entrepreneur runs their business. So with that, Then we come in and we say, well, we know you need this, 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 and this, because these are the the foundational pieces, right? We're building a house on a strong foundation. And then that way, when all the other random things come in, oh, I got a scary notice from the IRS or, oh, this person said, hey, would you like to do this joint venture? Well, let us run the numbers for you and tell you if it makes sense to do that. Or, you know, just all the different opportunities that come up, we layer in the foundational work on top of all of the pressing my hairs on fire because I need to do this, this and have these answers um, immediately. So that's kind of the the general of the fractional CFO in our firm. I've seen a lot of business owners go out to like Upwork and those other sites and things like that. And that can work too if you are already a financially savvy person and you you can say, I just need this, go do this, go do this. What happens is a lot of business owners don't have that like ability to manage that role. And so they just end up, the CFO looks at them like, well, what what would you like me to do? And you're like, I don't know, you go down, you know? So you don't really get the ROI. So with a service like ours, like I said, it's a recipe. We're going through, we know we're gonna take you, okay, here's what's gonna happen next. Here's how to plan, here's how to prepare. Here's how we're profitable and all those types of things. So just depends on your comfort level as as a business owner. Are you ready to take your brand to new heights? Join the Brand Amplifier for Entrepreneurs program. Learn how to build, elevate, and amplify your brand with a comprehensive 10-module course. Learn more about it and other ways to implement our strategies at fullcapacitymarketing.com. Click on EFCM Learning Hub for more information. Can't wait to help you amplify your brand. Well, and now you're not just helping other people's businesses, but you're running your own and you have team members. What was it like when you made that shift into entrepreneurship? Are there some, can you share some, I wish I would have known with us and then some successes and aha moments that you had? Yeah. Well, I'm still working on the the whole sales and marketing thing. It's like, we always joke we're the best kept secret. And that's not a good thing when you're running a business. <laughs> so I think that's really was something that I didn't have that skill set. You know, I, I came out of college and went into corporate and I knew my section of how a business operates. And so I really had to learn all of that. So getting mentors, getting, surrounding myself in the right communities of other entrepreneurs that I could, you know, just hear what they were up to. And it just expanded my what's possible. 
So those are some of the things that I, I early on had to, you know, uh, figure out real fast if I wanted to keep the clients coming in. And I think, you know, it's nice depending on your business model. Ours is a, um, you know, we, they stay with us for three, four years and we help them exit or do something else. So it's a nice business model that I, I fell into, right? I didn't realize that, you know, I was setting that up from the beginning. And so thank you to the accounting model for that already being in place. But that's one thing, you know, when we talk to a lot of our clients, we're looking at, you know, what type of revenue do you have? Do you have to sell this every month to hit your sales goals? Because that's really stressful. Can you set up some kind of uh, reoccurring revenue streams or, you know, automated things? And, you know, so we're always looking at the model and how do we tweak the model to make it so it's more enjoyable for the business owner and profitable? Yeah, definitely. And what are some things, has anybody ever come to you and you're like, oh my gosh, I wish you would have hired me three years ago. Uh, And you've had to help them work through some big things that might have either helped them continue to have a successful business or made them have to rethink having a business entirely. I just want people who are listening, who are entrepreneurs to be realistic. I think many of us have had a lot of ups and a lot of downs. And these are some things that you have to think about sometimes or situations you might find yourself in. Yeah, I will just say that we will all exit our business at some time, whether that is planned. And the reality is, is that, you know, we're human. We've got outside family and and other things that you just sometimes you can't see coming. So there's been times where, you know, a business is forced to sell due to a death of a partner or somebody is really sick and they're just saying, hey, I'm, I'm hanging it up. I'm not coming back to, you know. And having a strong operating agreement in place is really, really important. Setting up your business with a succession plan. So whether that's somebody that is from within the company is your succession plan, having key man life insurance so that your business is going to, if something happened, you know, to one of the partners, you're going to get some cash in to be able to have time to find that right new hire or fit. And then just probably the most common one is I want to sell my business because something has changed in my life and I don't want to own this anymore. I don't want to work in it as much as I am. And they're not set up to have the valuation that in their head, all these years they're working towards. And then when we put pen to paper, we're like, yeah, it's really not worth that. And here's all the steps that you're going to have to take. It's probably going to take you a couple of years to hit that number that you had in mind. And uh, it's really heartbreaking when they're like, well, I'm done. I'll just, I'll take whatever I can get for it. You know, you know, I always tell our clients like build this business and all of the processes and all of the components of it as if tomorrow somebody said, I'm going to give you 7 million for your company or 20 million or whatever your number is, right? You want to be able to go, oh yeah, come take a look under the hood because this is a, you know, I've got all my legal documents in order. You don't have to have audited financials. You just have to have match, your financials have to match your tax returns. I mean, it's really not complex, but you'd be surprised that it's just, I think so many business owners and I love them all because that's who we support. This is not their favorite part of the business. And so it's often the neglected piece, but when it comes to exit, it's the most important piece out of all the things. You can have SOPs, you can have a team managed business, you can have reoccurring revenue, you can have all these other great things that bump up your valuation. But if you don't have clean numbers and they can go back and see Okay, I see the growth. I see, you know, you filed your tax returns. You've done all, you've got all your documents, you know, historical. Save your bank statements, save your reconciliation reports, put them in a folder in the, you know, in the cloud so that you have everything organized. That ends up being the most important piece. And unfortunately, that's the piece most business owners neglect all along the way. And it really, really, really takes a chunk out of what you could get for your business. Because what they do is they come in and they go, oh, I'm going to offer you, you know, this really great number. And the business owner gets super excited. They get an LOI signed and then they come in and start the due diligence. And then they just start chipping away at that dollar amount. And emotionally, that business owner is already so are, spent the money 20 times in their head. And then they end up really getting such a small amount because they didn't have this piece of their business. Yeah. lot to think about. For sure. <laughs> We've talked a lot about things people need to consider when they are 
starting their business, they're figuring out the finances, they're figuring out what, who to hire and what to hire. We'll have the resource on um, your website in the show notes and be tagging it on socials as well. So we'll be able to lead people to your resource with those questions. But what are some other common mistakes you see people make when they're first starting their business? Sure. Well, we talked about pricing. The other mistake I see is that they pay too much for their team members because they're not super clear on what the role actually needs to be in order to sell the services or products that they're delivering. And so we see that they'll overpay and then all of a sudden they have to raise their prices when we come in and do that analysis and then they've priced themselves maybe out of the market, you know, like what the competition is charging and things like that. So it becomes one of those to be really, really clear on each of the roles in the business and the skill level that you need. And, you know, you should have like a good, better, best. And if you're just starting in your business, you as the business owner are probably going to be like the main producer, deliverer, whatever you want to call it. And so you need supporting roles underneath you. You need to build out those systems and have a repeatable process that's profitable. And so build one of those first before you start layering in different offerings. And then once you have one that's profitable and your team can pretty much deliver it, then roll out the next one and do the same exact exercise and make sure that it's profitable before you keep going. The other thing is on your financial statement. So in your chart of accounts, that ends up being how your profit and loss is laid out. Make sure you're splitting out your revenue stream. So if you've got four different products or services that you sell, make sure they're listed. Product one, product two, product three, product four. And when you do your costing, your cost to get sold, product one, product two, product three, product four. So you could see which one of those are profitable because a lot of times what we see with business owners is, especially in the beginning, they just start creating all these offers to see which one's going to stick, right? Because in the beginning, we're just throwing spaghetti at the wall, like who will pay me for what? I've got all this knowledge, but I don't know how to package it quite yet. And so if on your financial statement, it just says revenue or income or sales, and then expenses, and you list out by expense, maybe you're doing shipping or, you know, whatever your cogs are, direct labor, you know, merchant processing things, you don't know which one of those is actually profitable or not. And so what we find is they're really good on one, two, and three, and then four is just killing them. And all their profit from one, two, and three is going to lift up number four to pay for the delivery of it. So, so that's probably what I would say if you're just getting started, be really meticulous with tracking your expenses against your revenue so that you have that visibility mm-hmm. and you're able to pivot, change your pricing, lower your delivery. Like those are all really easy things to do once you identify it and know that it needs to happen. Wonderful. Thank you. That's very helpful. I think that, yeah, and going back to like, you're becoming an entrepreneur, you're not thinking about that. You're thinking about, okay, I have all these things I want to do and I can serve people in all these different ways. But I love what you said about simplify. Let's take it back to profitability for the first one and then go likening a lot of what you say to the way that we approach branding and PR. Simplify the message. Like don't try to be all things to all people. Don't try to rush and make sure that your social media is perfect on every platform. Make sure that you have a really cohesive message that goes out across all of your channels. And so it's it's nice, it's interesting to like reframe it in my head of like, oh, I get that because <laughs> that's some of the same process, although it's very obviously very different too. Yeah, I mean, I think what you're saying, it's like, it's the fundamentals. We get so excited as business owners when we get that money start to come in, you're like, oh, someone's paying me for what I do. And it, it's such an exciting time, you know, in your entrepreneurial journey. But it's also when it's like you can either get these foundational pieces right now or suffer later when you have to go back and try and recreate. And and then also the other thing that's like the icing on top of the cake is that when you do bring in a fractional CFO and they see this years of data, oh, they're just going to love you to pieces. Because a lot of times what we do is we spend the first like one to four months setting up these systems to be tracking this data so we can analyze it. And so if you already come in with this set up so that we can look at the historical data and see, pull out those trends, pull out like, oh, just change this, change this, change this. Bam, you just got instant ROI because you have the data for us to look at. So just something else to kind of keep in mind and 
uh, I'm trying to bribe all of your listeners that are just starting, like, do it the right way, I promise. <laughs> well, I'll end with your predictive, predictable profit tool. Is that also, a, is that a course people can go through if they just, they're like, I need to understand the fundamentals before I move to the next step and hire the bookkeeper, the accounting partner, the CFO? Yeah, that's actually something that we are working on oh, nice. is to, to put that into a done with you slash DIY type program because how beautiful would it be if more business owners got this information early on? It would just save them so much heartache and headache down the road. So we are definitely working on on packaging all of that information into a, a way that they can go through it and also stay motivated, right? Because we want to show you, we want to say like, if you take this advice and implement it, you should expect to see a 10% change in minimum 10% change in this category in your business. So ultimately, by the end of the going through the program, that compounds, right? Add all those little percent wins up. You're looking at, you know, a 30 to 50% change in your business, which depending on where your revenue is at, that could be a massive amount of uh, return on your investment. So yeah, definitely. Well, you mentioned that one of the things that you you and your team call yourself is a best kept secret and that sales and marketing is an area that you are still working on for yourself and your business. I'd love for you to talk about how do you find clients now? Are you using thought leadership on LinkedIn? Are you do you have to do cold outreach? Is there referrals from your past business um, ventures when you were on the corporate side? What are some ways that you found to be effective um, and We'll see if I can give you any advice on uh, Sam either during this podcast episode or after. <laughs> so I would say that referrals is our number one by far. This has been a, a business that has doubled every year, referral only. And uh, we actually are just now starting to do like cold, you know, ads to cold traffic and you know, what is that messaging that's going to warm them up to go, yeah, actually, this is something I need and I want to invest in it and have a phone, you know, have a conversation about how it can help my business. But I think that the other thing that I've done has been um, a go-giver in all of the communities of entrepreneurs that I'm in and um, really just become like a resource that people can refer people to us and they know that we're going to take really good care of them, number one. But number two, if they have a question or like I get texts and it's like, oh, my friend so-and-so's business needs, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, cool, call so-and-so. You know, like I'm always like, how can I help and and connect and and add value in any group that I'm in? Um, So being in masterminds and business communities, it's like a twofold for us. Like I get to learn and I get to hear things that, you know, challenge the way that I've always thought of things and and see things differently or learn new tips, tricks, tactics, things like that. But I also get to really like it lights me up and get back and then also be that resource that that those business owners can come and learn and and find out things. And then also we have our own podcast. So it's the cash flow CFO. And you know, I'm talking about a lot of this stuff. Uh, I'm bringing in different business experts, right? So like Every entrepreneur should have a team of an attorney, a tax strategist slash prepare, a financial advisor, a CPA, and a CFO, right? So I'm always bringing those types of experts to come in and pick their brain. And then so that way the businesses can, you know, hear more about how we help them. And then we do have a Facebook group and a few other things. But I think really it's just like people have to hear it and they have to hear it that it's not scary and it's it's actually really easy to do and to have somebody like this on your team. So I think that the the YouTube, the podcast goes to YouTube and people get to watch and listen and learn and become more and more comfortable with the concept of what is a fractional CFO and how can it help my business? Fantastic. Is there anything that we haven't covered that you've just really want people to know. Yeah, I think we've definitely touched on it, but it's worth repeating. It's that go and get financial, somebody on your team that can help you. If this is not your zone of genius or something that lights you up and you want to do it, then the best thing you can do as a business owner, as an entrepreneur is to surround yourself with the right team. 
and go out and find and handpick those experts that will fill the gaps of where your, you know, strong competencies or your zone of genius is so that you have partners in your business that you can run this high level analysis, strategy decisions, spending decisions, investment decisions. You know, these are all things that are going to help your businesses grow, which will in turn allow you to, you know, put more people to work, to invest back into the economy. Like there's just so much win, win, win when you have a profitable business and you're being a good financial steward of of that business. So that that would be my my one thing. If you haven't already done so, go find that team and invest in the partnership because it will pay more dividends than you could ever even imagine as your business continues to grow and as the complexity increases. Fantastic. And Andrea, do you have a favorite quote or mantra or some words of wisdom that you live by? That's a tough one. There's, you know, I mentioned being a go-giver and I think that there's a book called The Go-Giver. Um, and it's one that we absolutely live by. And and I think it's just so true because you just never know in life. Like I grew up, my parents had a restaurant and my dad always jokes that oh, he couldn't ditch school because when he was, you know, way back in the day, <laughs> give my dad a hard time. Uh, you know, my dad, my, my grandpa would call the principal and say, I need Doug to come and bust tables for me. And the, the in the restaurant. And so he was like, I couldn't not be at school because my dad would always find out. So, I, you know, I just growing up in the community, you know, with the restaurants and things like that, like you just never know who knows you or knows your family or you never know who somebody you meet at a business event might be somebody that's really crucial to, you know, helping you move your business forward or for you to whatever it is that you're trying to achieve. So be a go-giver and um, and it will, you know, always be something that serves you in life. Awesome. That is fantastic. And I, yeah, that's a fantastic book as well. So Andrea, thank you so much for being on the show today. Again, we had Andrea Jensen, the cash flow CFO. We will put the link to her podcast and her website in the show notes for everybody. And with that, make sure that you're thinking about your finances as you're listening to this episode and setting yourself up for the most success possible. And the only way to do that is to really make sure that you're doing everything appropriately when it comes to money, finances, taxes, all of that stuff, because that is a place where so many of us don't have as much experience and don't plan as well for. With that, I will be back again in a few days with another amazing expert to give you advice on your entrepreneurship journey. Thanks for listening. Want more? Check out AmplifyWithAnnika.com or follow me on socials at AmplifyWithAnnika.com.